Let's talk about the ASEA heavy duty engine oil specs, also known as the ASEA E category. So just as a reminder, ASEA is kind of a group comprised of most of the major manufacturers that have kind of a manufacturing presence in Europe. So they don't necessarily have to be European companies because you'll see the likes of Toyota and Hyundai on this list. However, they do have manufacturing bases in Europe. Now, recall that um, these sort of sit in a group of regulations. So we have the uh, fuel emissions regulations, which are dictated by the likes of the EPA in the US, as well as the EU, obviously in, uh, in Europe. So those get set and they require certain emissions coming out of the tailpipe. So then the manufacturers get together and they come up with a whole bunch of different technologies that are going to help them meet those emissions criteria. And then the lubricants, as we've discussed previously, are an enabling technology. So once those um, technologies have been developed, like exhaust gas recirculation and uh, SCRs and DPFs, then that obviously places additional stresses upon the lubricants. And so we've had to develop new categories to help uh, both the lubricant stay in grade, but also to ensure that the uh, equipment continues uh, to be protected under uh, more severe conditions. Now, if you remember, we've kind of got two paradigms. So early on, we were mainly focusing on things like particulate matter as well as NOx emissions. And then since then, we've kind of moved on to a more of a fuel efficiency paradigm where we're trying to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's coming out of the tailpipe. Now, ASEA is a little bit different from the API categories because where API uh, you know, splits up its oil categories into spark ignited and compression igni uh, ignition engines, um, ASEA does it by light versus heavy duty, which means that both uh, gasoline and diesel engines actually incorporate into both of those categories, right? So A and B incorporated light duty gasoline and diesel engine oils, which have higher saps, so not high saps, you'd probably classify them as being mid-level saps, but higher than the other category, which is the catalyst friendly category, which is also compatible with both gasoline and diesel engine oils. And that is the lower saps category. So if you remember in a previous video, we've discussed all of these different requirements. Now, how to sort of uh, place those requirements in context. So effectively, if we had uh, two dimensions where you measure uh, saps as well as fuel efficiency, then you can kind of split all the different A, B, and C categories into a matrix that sort of looks like this. And this is relevant in the diesel engine world for light duty vehicles like vans, like delivery vehicles. Um, you know, uh, we would call it a ute <laughs> in Australia. You call it a pickup truck in the, in the US. These obviously have diesel engines, but are not really heavy duty. Once we get into the likes of the, the big road haulers or locomotives, obviously, Diesel engines are present in, in many other areas like um, power generation, um, you know, mine, mine trucks, uh, construction equipment, all that kind of stuff. Now we're starting to talk about more uh, heavy duty applications. And so the C, A and B categories are no longer relevant. And that's where we get into the E categories. Now this is particularly relevant because there is a May 2022 update to this category. Uh, and so we'll talk about um, both the existing 2016 categories as well as the new 2022 categories. So as of 2016, when the E category was updated, there were really uh, four different um, uh, different categories. So we started with E4. I'm not going to read all this out, but it's basically an oil which is designed to meet Euro 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 emissions requirements. When you moved up to E6, the major differences were now we're catering towards a Euro 6. Um, we're also uh, catering towards engines with or without particulate filters and uh, a low sulfur diesel fuel. So we've moved on a little bit from the E4 category. Once you moved on to E7, the difference between E4 and E7 was a little bit different. Now we're actually going for a uh, sort of counterintuitively a reduced drain interval, interval in comparison to an E4. Um, we're starting to account for bore polish and we're talking about you know most EGR engines and most engines that are fitted with NOx reduction systems. Once you go to E9, right, the major differences are that we're talking again about uh, Euro 6 requirements. So the difference between E7 and E9 is that now we're accounting for, for Euro 7 and it's strongly recommended uh, for engines fitted with particulate filters and is designed for use in combination with low sulfur diesel fuel, which is not a feature of the E7 category. 
Now, in 2022, E6 and E9 were replaced with the E8 and E11 categories, right? So they're direct replacements for the old ones. Now, it's, it's, it's um, essential that we understand uh, both sets of categories because the 2016 categories, which include E6 as well as E9, are actually still going to be relevant until 2024. So lubricant manufacturers can continue to market their products um, with those approvals all the way through to 2024 when those uh, categories are going to become obsolete and uh, new test criteria um, are going to need to be adhered to, con to continue to re um, retain that classification. So if we want a bit of a diagram on, on how this looks, we could basically put two, two requirements on the two axes. One is soot-related wear control and then piston cleanliness. Now, there are a number of defunct categories now, E1 through E5, um, but effectively, you know, it's been a, an exercise in trying to increase the amount of piston cleanliness and soot-related wear control with each iteration of the ASEA categories, right, as the uh, requirements have gotten more and more stringent. Now, um, basically, E4 and E6, as well as E7 and E9, can be bucketed together, and you see that there are, they're trying to achieve slightly different aims. So E4 and E6 are going a little bit more for piston cleanliness, E7 and E9 are going for a little bit more for soot-related wear control. And of course, right, because E8 uh, and E11 are direct replacements, they sit in those categories as well. So the other way that we can think of it is that if you mapped um, saps on the x-axis and the drain interval uh, on the on the y-axis, you could sort of set up this matrix. And, and again, right, E8 and E11 are direct replacements for those categories. So now let's have a look at some of the, the new and the old tests um, that have been brought about by both the 2016 and 2022 updates. So if you look at, for example, um, the oil properties, the um, updates in 2022 haven't been all that extensive. So obviously we're replacing the E6 and the E9 categories with E8 and E11, but overall the changes have really only really been around like sort of seal compatibility. Um, and if you continue on, um, you know, before we had to report levels of um, both, both phosphorus and sulfur, we're now also gonna report uh, levels of chlorine as well. So it's just, you know, um, it's not even really an additional test. All right, when we go onto the second page um, of oil degradation, again, E6 and E9, we're obviously going to replace those with E8 and E11 in the 2022 update. And not a huge amount of changes, really. Um, most of them have got to do with uh, slight changes to the rules around foaming tendency. But beyond that, really, really not that much change. Where we do start to get into a lot of changes is in the engine testing categories. And a lot of the changes in the en engine testing, um, you'll see this as kind of an overall theme, a lot of it is really to bring the testing a little bit more in line with some of the API testing that's done. That's really going to help lubricant manufacturers because they won't need to sort of double up on tests. You'll be able to use uh, test results which are relevant for the CJ and CK categories and bring them across to the ASEA categories as well. So, once again, we're replacing E6 as well as E9 with E8 and E11, right? And there's just some simplification over the soot in oil test, right? We're only having to report one number rather than three. Um, so that's pretty um, pretty easy. Where some of the big changes have happened is around sort of that bore polish and piston cleanliness requirements. So there's three new tests that are coming in. There's the OM471, uh, there's Caterpillar 1N and Caterpillar C13. So the uh, uh, Caterpillar 1N is an interesting one because that was originally introduced as part of the API CJ4 um, testing requirements. So that's a 2.4 liter uh, Caterpillar direct injection diesel engine that test runs for about 252 hours. All right. So, and we're going to evaluate a whole bunch of uh, different components at the end of the test. And that really is only relevant for the E7 category now. The CAT C13 test is again another test which was introduced also as part of the API CJ4 classification. So that's a, a Caterpillar C13 engine. That the test is run for about 500 hours. Similar thing, we take apart the engine and we give it sort of a merit rating at the end. Now, um, that test is actually only relevant for the E11 category, right? So um, so there is some changing uh, changes to the testing around there. The Cummins ISM test is is retained. So this is a, a test which is um, kind of uh, 
uh, simulating deposits and, and sludge in the engine. And we've just changed uh, some of the reporting requirements um, for the E7 category there. Um, again, around the Mac T12 test, okay, again, that is a test that um, is shared in common with the API uh, CJ4 and up categories, right? Um, so that's a that's a Mac E7 E-Tech engine, I think, that has exhaust gas recirculation on it. And they actually do um, a, a modification to, I think it's the piston where they have a like a low swirl combustion design to sort of um, uh, basically reduce the completeness of the combustion, which means that you're artificially generating more soot uh, than, than you should. And so you're, you're sort of stressing the engine and stressing the oil in that way. Again, there's some changes around the, the reporting requirements there. All right, so that's kind of all of the, the, the engine testing uh, that has been changed. Now there is um, a second page of engine testing, which is a little bit more unique to ASEA. So one of the inter interesting things, one of the interesting and major differences between the ASEA testing as well as the API is the presence of a biodiesel uh, or biofuel impact test. Now this one's a really interesting one because um, it sort of reflects the differences in uh, regulatory environments between the US and uh, and Europe where there's probably a little bit more of an emphasis on, on biodiesel inclusion as part of a renewable strategy. So the thing is about biodiesel is that it's really not good for your lubricant. Uh, when biodiesel gets into the crankcase, it can negatively affect um, the performance of the oil because it, it starts to generate things like acids, which increases the tan levels that depletes your total base number, etc. So um, that can result in um, a lot of engine sludge, for example, and we might run into things like um, bearing corrosion problems. So um, the ASEA categories have always had a, well, not always, but they have a, um, a specific test which caters towards uh, biofuel impact, where I believe they actually inject um, some biodiesel into the crankcase directly um, to, to stimulate the impact of that. Um, in the 2022 update, there aren't many changes to that, aside from a change to some of the reporting um, uh, requirements and the, the, the limits on that test. There are two uh, new tests, which again are a little bit more in line with the API category. So the Volvo T13 test has been introduced. Uh, that's sort of an oxidation stability test that was introduced as part of the CK and FA4. Um, that tests really oxidation stability and its impact on bearing corrosion. So that's a, a modified uh, a MAC uh, MP8 diesel engine, obviously Mac being kind of part of the Volvo group is why it's called the Volvo T13 test, even though it's a Mac engine. Um, so um, that will be now a common test between CK4, FA4, as well as the ASEA categories, specifically E8 and E11. The other one that's been introduced is the, um, the COAT test, which is the Caterpillar uh, oil aeration test. That's actually run on a Caterpillar C13 engine in uh, kind of like a high idle condition just to stimulate that uh, oil aeration, but it's doing so in the idle condition because they don't want to thermally stress the oil. So um, again, uh, that's, that's sort of a test, I think, which is uh, common to the, uh, I think it's common to the APIs as well. So as you can see, um, there's been a lot of work. The uh, ASEA 2022 uh, e category update was actually delayed by a couple of years, predominantly because of COVID. Um, but it's important to understand both the E category as um, as well as the A, B, and C categories when it comes to diesel engines, right? Because obviously one represents light duty, the other represents heavy duty, and you know we're going to continue to see updates here um, as uh, API kind of moves on from FA FA four and CK four. Um, and and ASEA continues to look at updating their specs as well. I'd expect that what we'll see in the next update is more um, emphasis on things like fuel efficiency as well as low viscosity grades.